This is frequency response example number two. Plot a system's frequency response, both magnitude and phase, given its impulse response. Here we have a linear time invariant system with an impulse response, h of n. In part a, we are looking for the system's frequency response written in a particular form where we isolate the real valued amplitude function and the phase function. Let's talk about the overall approach to part A. In general, frequency response can be determined from the impulse response as the infinite summation of the impulse response values, h uh, indexed by k, times e to the minus j omega k. Now in this particular impulse response, we see that the coefficient at n equals zero is two and the coefficient at n equals two is also two. Of course, there's a coefficient at n equals one as well. We'll start out with the coefficient at n equals zero. So we take k equals zero in our summation. We have a coefficient one at index one, and then a coefficient two at index two. Now the general strategy here is to rewrite the terms in terms of complex conjugate pairs. If we focus our attention on the extremes here, I could imagine converting these by incrementing the index by one, and then I'll keep everything the same as long as I remember to multiply by e to the minus j omega one. So I essentially multiply by a term that preserves all of the values. Now, if you multiply through by this term, you'll be able to convince yourself that you are still left with the original function. Now, the purpose of doing this is that complex conjugate pairs can be translated into cosine function. And cosine is ne in this case is necessary to get us the real valued amplitude function. Now the phase function will be whatever is left over and that will correspond to this exponential that we introduced outside. So that's kind of the broad picture of how we go about isolating in terms of amplitude and phase functions. Now in part B, we want to plot the frequency response magnitude as well as the phase. So we'll have two plots all together, magnitude and the phase. We'll just use the main period here, minus pi to plus pi for the frequency omega. Now I'm not trying to necessarily sketch out the uh, exact details of the answer, but broadly speaking, we're going to have a, a cosine-like function, and then we'll have a phase function, which corresponds to minus omega. Now we want the phase to exist in the range of minus pi to plus pi. So in general, we can add or subtract two pi as needed to ensure that that function lies within that range of minus pi to plus pi. Now it's important to recognize that we're trying to plot the magnitude. Magnitude is always zero or positive. Anytime that we have to change the sign to flip the negative portions of the magnitude response to go positive, that means we have to then introduce a negative sign into the phase plot because this amounts to a sign change. So over in phase, we likewise need to change the sign. Now, the way we change sign 
is simply adding or subtracting pi as needed. All right, let's move into the details here. Our frequency response equation looks like this. Now at n equals zero, we have a value of two. At n equals one, we have a value of one, even though it's not ex uh, expressly written there. And then n equals two, our coefficient is two. Well, this means that our summation really only includes three values. That would be two times e to the minus j omega with k equals zero. And then moving on to the next one, that would be with k equals one. And finally, this is with k equals two. Now let me begin by first multiplying by one. So e to the minus j omega zero, that's still one at that point. Now our strategy revolves around finding what I'm gonna call the center value here. So if we look at the indexes or indices of our extreme points here, two and zero, if I find the average value, which would be two plus zero divided by two, we have a value of one. What I'm gonna do is decrement this index by the value one, and I can do that provided that I increment all of the other index values. So if I add one to each of these, then I've uh, preserved the value of the original equation. So increasing means that I'd be left with positive j omega. This means I'd be at j omega zero, and here I would be at minus j omega one. All right, let's simplify this a little bit and see where we're at. We have one plus j e to the j omega plus two times e to the minus j omega. I'll pull the two as our constant term out front. And then we still have our complex exponential sitting out here off to the side. Now we recognize this as the form of a cosine, especially if I divide by two and then multiply by two to account for that extra two that I've just introduced into the denominator. Now I can rewrite that as cosine omega, and we're left with one plus four cosine omega times e to the minus j omega. And that's our results for part A. All right, so we'll need that as our starting point for part B. This is where we are trying to plot the magnitude and the phase. I'm going to begin by creating a plot for the amplitude and phase functions. I'll start here and then we'll just make uh, gradual modifications to the plots until finally we get the magnitude and the phase. All right, let's see what this looks like. There's cosine omega. Four is going to uh, in basically expand the size of the cosine. And then the one is going to shift it up by one. So we start at minus three and end up at five. Now I need this zero crossing. So that would be one plus four cosine omega, setting the result equal to zero. Do a quick solution for omega. We call that omega naught for the zero crossing. This would give us the inverse cosine of minus one fourth. And I punched that out in the calculator to get 1.823 radians per sample. If I divide that by pi, then I can write this out as some scale factor times pi. And before I forget, let me get the proper appropriate units on phase. 
All right, that's pretty close to 0.6 pi, and that will be good enough for plotting purposes. So 0.6 pi is located right there. And then we have, of course, minus 0.6 pi on the other side. So our cosine has a maximum value of 5 and a minimum value of minus 3. All right, get that sketched in here. Now I'm going to turn my attention to the phase function. Now in general, we want to keep their, our phase plot with a range of minus pi to plus pi, and that, that range is in the vertical direction. Now the useful part of our phase is simply minus omega. So as you look at various values for omega, we find that it's simply a straight line with a decreasing uh, value, or we would say it has a negative slope. All right, now we can start making some headway in terms of getting this looking like a proper magnitude response. What I notice here is that I need to change the sign in two places. That would be in this zone. I need to flip the function positive. And as soon as I do that, that tells me I've got to add or subtract pi down in my phase plot. And the same thing over here on the other side. So it looks like I need to bring this section of the graph down by a value of pi. In this case, I need to add pi in order to keep that section still in the overall range of minus pi to plus pi. Now let's see if we can figure out what that value happens to be. Again, based on the fact that it's just minus omega, it looks like that is a value of 0.58 times pi. And in a similar way, this would be minus 0.58 pi. This distance is pi. So it means we take a jump from 0.58 pi down to 0 0.42 pi. And so this lower value is at minus 0.42 pi. All right, at this point, we've now constructed the uh, phase of our frequency response and the magnitude of the frequency response.